morning, everybody. I'd like to start today's session by acknowledging the First Peoples, the traditional custodians of the land on which we are presenting this festival, and also the lands on which uh, people at home are uh, watching today. Uh, at this time, I also think it's really appropriate uh, to pay respects to the first scientists of these lands. Increasingly, in many scientific fields, we're recognising the important contribution of First Nations science. Queensland Museum is very proud to be the exclusive host of World Science Festival in the Asia Pacific. On behalf of Queensland Museum, I'd like to acknowledge all the partnerships that have made this festival possible, particularly World Science Festival New York, Queensland Government, Tourism and Events Queensland, Brisbane Economic Development Agency, BHP, University of Queensland, Griffith University and QUT. My name is Christine Jackman, and I'm going to be host for the um, fascinating discussion that we're expecting today. I worked in uh, the Press Gallery in Canberra what feels like eons ago, about 20 years ago. And when I was working there, science wasn't something that was discussed very often at all. Indeed, it wasn't something that you would expect to enter the, the halls of uh, power. Obviously, that's beginning to change, and the two big seas that have changed that are climate change and COVID. But the reality is, science has always laid at the heart of many, many of the portfolios that exist in Canberra. Natural resources, health, education, innovation and energy, just to name a few. But interestingly, of the 84 ministers and shadow ministers that we have currently sitting in Canberra, there are three science degrees among them and two engineering degrees. Here's a little tip for your next trivia, uh, qui trivia quiz at the local pub. Uh, can you name any of them? I'll tell you one, it's the Prime Minister. Prime Minister Scott Morrison, believe it or not, has a Bachelor of Science in Applied Economic Geography. <laughs> However, it's safe to say that our politicians aren't scientific experts, and um, nor should they be. Um, so today, we're going to be asking how we can bring more science into the political equation and what happens when those two things uh, come face to face with one another. I encourage particularly those at home to uh, ask questions via Twitter or indeed if you're in the audience, I'll be throwing to Twitter questions uh, when we get them coming in. Uh, please use the hashtag Ask WSFB, that's Ask WSFB for World Science Festival Brisbane, and I will throw to you when I can. Now, we've both got both virtual and in-person uh, guests today because that's the nature of living in a COVID universe. Let's start with those online. Um, sorry, it's the nature of... Uh, at home, We've got somebody who can see us and, and hear the audience, so make sure she, you give her a big, a big welcome. She's a best-selling author, opinion columnist and podcaster, and she's also advised governments on issues such as gender equality, childcare, media and employment. She's been named in the Australian Financial Review's 100 Women of Influence and is also an ambassador for Royal, Women, uh, Royal Melbourne Hospital Neuroscience Foundation. Please welcome Jamila Resby. Again. Hi, thanks for having me. Now, we've got this wonderful screen full at the moment, but I think we've got room for some more guests on stage. Our ne next guest was Senior Advisor to the Sen Senator, the Honourable Kim Carr, Science Minister in the Rudd and Gillard governments. He had policy responsibility for science and research and later served as Chief of Staff in Opposition. He's currently also the Director of Government, Relationship, uh, sorry, Government Relations at QUT. Please welcome John Byron. Good day. Thank you, Christine. And our final guest is currently Queensland Chief Scientist, but he's also a conservation scientist and mathemat mathematician. He's helped develop uh, software to rezone the Great Barrier Reef. He's an avid birder and is on the board of directors of BirdLife Australia. He's also a huge advocate for citizen science particularly citizen scientists such as yourself who might turn out on a, a Sunday morning. So please welcome Hugh Possingham. Good morning, Christine. Good morning. 
Now, while Hugh is our, latest, our, our last live guest, I was also able to um, uh, welcome one more contributor to the conversation who we had to pre-record uh, earlier due to time, time constraints and conflicts. He is the 29th uh, Prime Minister of Australia, Malcolm Turnbull. And you'll see our interview with Malcolm later today. This is a non-scientific issue. I've got a paper issue. Um, <laughs> sorry about that, folks. Um, so let's turn to uh, the experiences of each of you folks, and that's turning ideas and great policy ideas into, uh, that come from good science into political action. For most of the people here today, and um, possibly uh, people in your own lives, life inside the Canberra bubble is sort of a completely foreign thing. So I'd like to walk us through what actually happens, how we see something that might uh, strike us as completely obvious rational science, and how somehow something at the other end comes out as a omelette, a scrambled eggs, or something that we don't recognise as the eggs that we put in at the beginning. Um, John, tell me, have you been in the situation, I'm sure you have as uh, in working in the uh, portfolio of science, where you've seen that experience of some piece of um, evidence uh, that, that's been developed by scientists to address a problem, and how do you shepherd that through to, to a, a, a meaningful outcome? So like every good question, uh, the <laughs> answer starts with the words, well, it depends. Um, <laughs> and it depends a bit on whether you're responding to an emerging risk or whether you're trying to pursue an opportunity or even whether the policy you're trying to do is about how you support science itself. Um, but the example that comes immediately to mind is that uh, in my time in government, we had a challenge, a biosecurity challenge in Australia from an invasive species of honeybee, and it was going to threaten the viability of our native honeybees, which is a problem for uh, our wild flora, but was also potentially a, a disastrous problem for the Australian honey industry. And so uh, CSIRO did some early work on this and worked really effectively with uh, the agriculture department and also the state agriculture departments and environment departments to, uh, to introduce some serious regulatory measures very quickly. And they responded really, the, the political class responded very quickly to uh, the unambiguous scientific early warning that they were given. Uh, and it was a good example of how, how much science is actually trusted, um, in particular when you're able to accompany it with um, all of the other ramifications, the environmental and economic ramifications of not moving quickly. So it sounds like what you're saying there is that we actually in Australia, we're blessed with good science, good scientific oh, yeah. researchers, that they're available when needed. Um, and that, that uh, example you spoke to there rings to me, uh, rings uh, true to the situation that we've seen in COVID, in that in many, particularly in Australia, we've seen many scientists rise to the challenge that was placed before us that was obviously a, a, an overarching clear and present danger. And I'd also like to take my um, a moment here to just acknowledge the great work we saw at University of Queensland. While that vaccine may not have uh, made it to the final hurdle, I think we all should realise just the amazing amount of work that went on um, at the University of Queensland with that team uh, working there night and day. So I'd actually invite everybody to give them a round of applause. Um, Hugh, though, not every problem has that has the I guess the benefit of everybody agreeing that it is a problem and that there is a you know a, a clear path forward that needs to be developed. So can you can you speak about a bit about that? Uh, yeah, and I, I like your omelette analogy, Christine, <laughs> because I mean science may be the eggs, which may be the heart of the omelette, but but policy is an omelette. It's 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 a messy thing, and but I, and I prefer eating an omelette than raw eggs. <laughs> um, so I'm glad that that all these things to come to play. And I think on an issue like biosecurity, every Australian is, is lockstep. We want to stop uh, uh, diseases coming from overseas. And so the science is there to solve an entire national problem. Uh, some of the issues I've been involved in, like marine protected areas, everybody's not necessarily in lockstep. So it's always a contentious issue. Um, we have built in our group software to try to resolve that contentious issue. It's actually mathematical software that um, uh, 
takes into account the interests of the fishing community, recreational, commercial, and tries to balance that, the economic side, with biodiversity and nature. Could I stop you there and ask, are you, are you saying then that when you look at the, a, a, a natural wonder like the Great Barrier mm. Reef, that you're balancing up how much value it brings uh, in terms of money mm. versus its um, innate value as a, as a wonder of the world? That, that's right, and, and as scientists, or in, in some senses, I'm a mathematician as well, a uh, mix of economics and trying to solve problems, like it's an engineering problem, really, which bits of the Great Barrier Reef, reef, which bits of the whole of Australia should be fully protected, partially protected. You are balancing multiple problems. There's a heap of science behind it, but there's a heap of economics and there's a heap of maths, and we actually provide our software's multiple solutions. So then those multiple solutions go onto the table for the stakeholders and they get to choose between them. They meet a minimum set of standards. So in the Great Barrier Reef is they would protect 20% of the distribution of every species and 20% of every habitat. That was a bottom line. Um, but I think that's where scientists, they're not there to provide the solution. They're to provide evidence and they're, provide, they're to provide options and they're also there to provide mechanisms for weighing up those options, which is then they're almost an economist. Can I throw, I'm going to throw a question without notice at you about this. I've seen, uh, I think the Great Barrier Reef Foundation put out uh, figures a couple of years ago that said that the, the reef is worth mm. six billion mm. uh, towards the GDP every year but when tourism yeah. was still happening. Yeah. If we didn't have that value, if we, if, if for example, we said, you know, no tourists mm. are coming, yeah. no value, no value there, we take all that money away, does that mean it's not worth protecting? Uh, not at all, because we have the now protected area system across the entire country, federally and different states have built their protected area systems, and often there is no tourism in those areas. The offshore uh, parts of the Kimberleys aren't bringing in a $6 billion of tourism. So we as a nation committed to protecting a certain fraction of all ecosystems in protected areas. That's what the Australian people believe in, overwhelmingly. 90% of them believe that's an important thing to do. So we are, it's not just about being an economist. It's, it's also about uh, presenting options. It is a democracy, and a democracy is not about making as much money as possible. But that said, and we will come back to this, mm. I think, it's easier to protect pretty things, cuddly things, than it is to protect something hidden away that, you know, a, a, an insect, a, a garden yeah. variety slug or something. We have 1,800 nationally listed threatened species, and I could guarantee you most people don't know 1,750 of them. <laughs> So. Hugh has had some interesting fights on that front, and we may come back to a few of them um, later on. But uh, Jamila, and I'll just to let you know, I'm not being rude to Jamila by keeping my back to her. She can see me out there, can't you, Jam? We'll wait to each other. <laughs> sure can. Um, I'm sure, as you, uh, you know, you've experienced that you were at the forefront of um, the climate change issues that really uh, took their toll on, on two uh, Labor Prime Ministers. And we will come back to climate change in the second half of this program because it, it, it deserves um, very detailed attention. But you've also been in other uh, ministers' offices. And can you tell me, from draw on some of that experience, to say when, when somebody's brought some research to you on a very important issue pertaining to one of your minister's portfolio um, responsibilities. How does that piece of evidence and that, that insight that may be driven by science get walked through the process to become you know, a meaningful, impactful policy? Thank you so much, Christine, and I'd like to acknowledge that, unlike the rest of you, I am coming to you from Wathorawan land here in uh, the Kulin Nation just outside of Melbourne. Um, I, my experience in Parliament was somewhat different. I was mostly working in political areas that didn't directly touch science. But one of the things that you learn, of course, is that science tends to touch everything in some way. Um, I worked for a long period as a policy advisor and uh, eventually chief of staff to Minister Kate Ellis when she was the early childhood minister. And when we were brought considerable evidence from psychologists and neurologists showing us the importance of investing in early childhood education in excess of what we were doing. Um, essentially recommending to us that early childhood education should be treated as part of the school system, uh, that we could make enormous positive inroads when it came to 
uh, the education and the pathways and the ongoing career success of young people, particularly those from disadvantaged backgrounds, if we got in early. They showed us that 90% of brain development in human beings happens in the first five years of life and that those five years are absolutely essential. And at the time, we weren't investing in the way we needed to be. That's where we began. We began with that piece of evidence. What we then had to do with those eggs, to torture this analogy even further, uh, was a really complex and long process, which had they actually been eggs, they would have gone off. Um, <laughs> the process required momentum. It required consensus from states and territories. It required parallel legislation across those states and territories, which requires questions about who gets credit, who gets talked to, who gets ownership. Uh, there are the questions of consulting with the relevant parties. So we were talking to the private childcare providers, also the public childcare providers, who have very different interests in how that would play out. Of course, there was the question of money and who was going to pay for the transition. And so by the time you get to the end, which for us was negotiating the passage of that legislation through Parliament, which took us three goes, three goes over four years because we couldn't get the thing through the Senate. And it was good policy and it has passed now and it remains good policy. But to do that required a political negotiation with crossbenchers, particularly for us, the Greens, where the interests are sometimes around good policy and partly around good policy, but also around good politics. They Jam, want credit, I stop they you want there? success in their electorate. Jam, can I stop you there and just ask, when you say it went to the Senate three times and that these crossbenchers were involved, what you've just outlined seems, again, like really straightforward, obvious, good policy based on good science. So were there, what were the particular sticking points in, in a couple of those instances? I think often it's about funding and it's about who has been in the ear of a particular member of government. It's about how to work in the area that they're from, particularly in something like early childhood education policy where each state and territory does things slightly differently. So bringing them all onto the same page, they're all starting at a different point. So I suppose the point that I'm trying to make is that there can be good policy and a variety of vested interests, all of whom are acting in a positive way, all of whom who want a good outcome. But the complexity of these issues means that often the science and the role of the science at that beginning seed where you say this is important starts to get dissipated um, and plays a smaller role in the eventual outcome. Did you ever despair that that was going to see the light of day? Did you ever want to give up? Uh, there were some teary moments sitting in the advisor's box in the Senate, for sure. Mm. Um, and I guess that guy, that's a, it's a great way to go into this idea of um, we're going to move away from eggs now and just say that, um, that, that that journey can be like, I think, running through treacle. It is very slow um, and can sap a lot of energy from the, those with the best will in the world. Um, Hugh, I know you've been through that and a couple of issues and also the fact that sometimes things that you think you've achieved can be rolled backwards. And I know that's an area that you've worked in with land clearing, particularly in Queensland. Can you speak a bit to that, that experience? Uh, yeah, so obviously the land clearing debate across Australia has been contentious, as is, has forestry since the 1980s. And I was born in South Australia and there it was resolved in the 90s, um, moving to Queensland. I actually thought it was going to be a long, long debate that uh, we wrote this thing called the Brigalow Declaration that outlined the consequences of land clearing in terms of loss of topsoil, impact on climate change, loss of biodiversity. And it was to beat his credit, he used that letter, he waved that letter, and he said, well, right, we're going to call an end to land clearing over the next couple of years. That said, politics change and things were opened up again. And so we have this flip-flop. And, and to be honest, the thing I learned from that enormously is uh, that you need both sides of politics to believe the science on these issues. You can't have one side of politics. It can't be a political issue. It's too important, just like climate change. In fact, land clearing was emitting as much carbon dioxide as half the cars on the road in Australia. Uh, that said, I must admit, I think the majority, the vast majority, 95% of landowners are good stewards, want to be better stewards and don't, and they do want to contribution, contribute to the climate change solution because they know natural climate solutions, sequestering carbon in trees and soils is going to be part of their economic future. That said, it has become now somewhat of a political issue and the danger is it will go backwards and forwards with politics and that's frustrating as you say, from a science perspective. So to recap on that, when, when you first wrote the, is it the Brigalow 
regulated? Declaration, yeah. Declaration uh, in the first, first decade of this century, yes, in the early 2000s? Yes, 2004. At that point, there was about the equivalent amount of land clearing happening in Queensland as was happening in the, in, in the Amazon, yes? Yes. Which is, yeah, we, we, we hear about that all the time. Yeah. And, and you successfully got the support of then Premier Peter Beattie, and then, it, then a change of government meant it was reversed relatively quickly, I think, in, in, the, in the first few months of, that, of the Newman government, yes? That's right. Um, at that point, what was your, what did you specifically learn um, that you would do differently when you talk about engaging both sides of, of Parliament? I would have just talked to the opposition. I mean, that and would the have opposition been the only, or the, I'm, I'm assuming you know their base were farmers who wanted yeah. to to clear land. Um, how do you convince those those people who may actually? Because I mm. think science. Um, there might be a clear outcome that we, we know things have to change. Then we discover that somebody's going to lose. In this case, I'm assuming that there were farmers out there who were saying, but I want to clear this land because my livelihood's yeah. involved in it. How would, you, how would you go about convincing those people? Uh, yeah, and, and with the, as a, member, a former member of the Wentworth Group, we were always strong on this issue, and we always believed in pay, paying stewardship payments to farmers to, to, because they're doing farm, something in the interests of the entire nation. So I think that's an important part of it. But, you know, I was doing this as a professor at the University of Queensland. It is not my full-time job. I do have, as an academic, spent up to 50 days a year working for NGOs, governments at all levels and public policy, the, the, the time a scientist has to prosecute a debate with all sides of politics, with all the interest groups, uh, developers, farmers, miners, is, I'm, I'm not a lobbyist. And so this is, this is probably where I think scientists get frustrated as they provide the inf information. The Brigolo Declaration was three pages long, with 20 references, and it said something that every single... There was no dispute amongst Australian scientists that this is the evidence that land clearing is not going to be good for people and nature and the economy. Mm, a consensus amongst scientists that gets rolled or ignored by the mainstream. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds familiar. Yeah, but to get a platform, you, you, you need, you know, a lot of struggle and efforts. So you've got to beat down the doors. And is that part of the problem that scientists are doing work in, in labs and in the field and, and you go to that point about we're not lobbyists and you don't have money, I assume, for, for lobbying, whereas no. if you're a big miner, and I, I should acknowledge that you know, we, you know, we don't want to make out that all miners are bad people, one of them has been a wonderful sponsor of this event, but you know, there's money there to enlist lobbyists who can tell your side of the story very effectively over the top of, of, of what might sound to a scientist yeah. like up and down science. Yeah. And in general, I just think all scientists would just like to be asked mm. more, if we could be, in a friendly way. Not, yeah. John, as somebody who's worked mm. for a Minister for Science, mm. is that what happens? Did you have a, a, a bunch of scientists on your, on your Rolodex or in your phone that you could ring up and ask politely and in a friendly way? Absolutely. And not only that, uh, possibly more importantly, you had in your access to people who can tell you who to talk to. So they weren't just the ones that I already knew. That helps. Uh, but you've got to know how to reach them at two or three removes because um, if you only restrict your advice to the people you've already come across, uh, you're probably going to just keep on thinking the way you've been thinking. Mm. And the whole point of evidence-based policy is that it's open to new ideas, sometimes even a 180-degree turnaround, which is difficult for politics to achieve and impossible to, for it to achieve without evidence. Um, and then what about when those lobbyists come knocking in the doors, on, on the doors of Canberra, as we know, you know, they do. It's what happens in Canberra, you know, it, whenever Parliament's sitting, there'll be a bunch of different suits. Um, you know, I've escorted some around those halls. They come and they p make their case. Um, and it's your job to hear them out. Yeah, and... and the thing to remember, I think, is that uh, you can call them lobbyists or you can call, call them advocates if, mm. they're not, uh, if they're not guns for hire, they're, they're not on the lobbyist register, mm. but they're still doing the same kind of job. Um, and the, they come with all sorts of arguments, sometimes diametrically opposed, and you'll finish one meeting with someone and the next meeting will be telling you that the previous people were talking rubbish and you do the opposite. It's... And then I'm guessing, I mean, what happens, for example, when politics gets rough and ready, and you might have somebody say, well, mate, 
you know, that science may be true, but I know that I can pour this much money into this many marginal seats and, you know, you could lose government because we can convince them, you know, that they're being ripped off by this, this policy or they're being hurt by this policy. Well, I think we all know some issues where that's been going on. But it's also worth remembering that um, politicians are taking scientific advice as one element of the decision-making matrix that they've got to look at. Sometimes it's a very important element, and with an existential risk like a, a pandemic or climate change, in my opinion, uh, it should be the overwhelming input. Um, but in less, uh, when things are less heightened, I think it's just one of several. And you know, we refer earlier about uh, you know, the democracy that we're living in and how we, we claim support for our ideas because 90% of Australians believe in it. Just like you can't choose your own facts, you can't selectively decide when democracy matters and when it doesn't. Uh, it's, it's actually a reality that, um, for instance, you know, people living in, in seats along um, the Queensland coast, um, they got a pretty hard serve from some people uh, f further south in, in this country um, around the time of the last federal election, uh, based on the idea that, that they were being selfish and they were willing to tip the rest of us over the cliff with climate change because of their, um, their need to sustain their communities. But who of us is going to vote to, to destroy our children's future? Nobody's going to. And so what we have to do as a community is present them with alternatives rather than say, shut that down. We've got to say, here's what we're going to do together to get where we need to go. I'm going to hold that question for a moment because, I, as I said, there's a lot we can talk about about climate change. I know we've got some questions on Twitter. Very quickly as we get those up, I'm going to ask Jamila, how important is it to have the Minister for Science in the Cabinet? This is something I think that's come up a little bit and there's been ongoing discussion about whether or not having a Minister in the Cabinet makes a difference. And I do think science and technology have sort of lacked that strong, stable leadership within government over the last three decades or so. Um, I was doing a quick count, so I might be slightly out, but I think we've had 11 federal ministers uh, with responsibility for science since 2007. Uh, that might change next week. Who knows? I hear uh, reshuffles <laughs> coming. Um, we've also had a, a couple of prolonged stints without a named science minister in the cabinet. Um, uh, and I think it was the Abbott government in two th 2013 where we just kind of didn't have it. Uh, the ministry list came out and science wasn't there, it wasn't named. Um, I think it is critical that you have a minister for science who has that in their title, who can bring and help to achieve kind of bipartisan support for science and technology in the halls of parliament so that uh, lobbyists and people in the industry know who to go to, who they can ask questions of, uh, in whatever space it is. And I think without that, you also don't get the, the shadow minister most of the time, which means you can often lose that focus on science um, that is so needed. Having said that, the push for a named minister in cabinet, I wonder if that's becoming as important as it used to be. To, to use a parallel example, for, uh, for instance, we have a minister for women who's in the cabinet for the first time in a long time. <laughs> It doesn't seem to be doing much. Mm. So I, I think we can get too caught up in the titles as a mark of respect or what the government cares about most. Um, I think the, the most important part is that we ensure that scientists are being heard by the government and that key decisions are being made with the import of science and research uh, being properly considered. If you look at the way that uh, for example, JobKeeper wasn't applied to universities. That is going to have huge ramifications for science and research for decades to come uh, mm. because we know that there have been more than 7,000 researchers lost from mm. Australian universities. That will have an impact down the track. Mm. Mm. Now, do we have a twist Twitter questions? Yes, we do. Um, we have a question from, I think, Professor Felice Jacker, if I'm reading that correctly. Why is... Um, in inverted commas, I don't believe, for example, in climate change, an acceptable excuse by politi politicians who deny overwhelming evidence. Anyone want to? I'm, I'm go. I think that's a wonderful question to lead into our next segment. We've devoted the entire last half of this um, conversation today to what's happened with uh, climate change, and that is actually um, a question that I investigated at length. Uh, with our next, with our um, pre-record guest, uh, the former Prime Minister um, Malcolm Turnbull. But by way of introducing that, I want to cast your mind back to back to a time uh, in the not so distant 
uh, uh, memory. Of, it was around the era 2006, 2007. Believe it or not, and it may sound like false news, that was an era where we had relative bipartisanship um, on the need for climate change action. That was an era when, in the lead up to the 2007 election, uh, then Prime Minister John Howard uh, swung his support behind an emissions trading scheme. It was an era where, believe it or not, Rupert Murdoch himself said that we should give the, uh, the planet the uh, benefit of the doubt, that we should support scientists who said that um, the planet needed action on climate change. So th that was 2007, and that is where I began my conversation with uh, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, and asked what happened next. Can we take that uh, go take the interview away there? Well, you could. I guess Tony Abbott was part of it, but I think he was he was a sort of a manifestation of a a rise in a sort of a fight back by the fossil fuel lobby, supported by uh, right wing populism. Um, the or nut jobbery, depending on how you want to describe it, which essentially turned issues of physics into questions of belief or identity, so that you we've now got to the loopy stage where people are still saying they believe or disbelieve in climate change or global warming, which is about as intelligent as saying you believe or disbelieve in gravity. But then the big factor here, a right, one of the biggest factors of course, was the Murdoch press. Uh, Murdoch's media has become more and more partisan over the years, over the 40 plus years I've known Rupert, and it has become uh, essentially now propaganda and very dangerous propaganda as the Americans learned on the 6th of January. Mm, absolutely. Can I, I'd, I'd like to delve in there because um, I, I guess it can be a chicken and egg argument, but obviously, a media that's prepared to uh, throw so much doubt on climate change is going mm -hmm. to prop up or help uh, politicians who do the same. Uh, which do you think came first? And do you, can you identify a time when the scales began to tip in favour of, um, of you know, politics and values driven, as you call, nut jobbery over science? Mm -hmm. Was there a particular time when you thought, hang on, this is different? Well, look, Howard never took climate change seriously in the sense that he was always a sceptic, right? So, you know, John supported an emissions trading scheme because he felt the politics of climate change in 2006, six seven was moving against him. We had a terrible drought, you may remember. And, you know, he, he was responding politically. Having, that's, you know, I'm just... Uh, I mean, that's not a criticism, that's a statement of fact. And so he, I wouldn't say he had a high level of commitment personally, but he certainly did take it to the election. Um, and, you know, and the irony is if he'd won the election, I suspect we would have had an emissions trading scheme in mm. place for many years. Um, what, what changed things? Well, really what changed things was the uh, shift of opinion in uh, America, uh, where the right, uh, the Republican right, moved from being rational about the environment, in the, as you know, the George Bush Senior had been, to becoming to uh, turning this issue into a values or identity issue, um, and that again, that that ecosystem, that right wing ecosystem, feeds on itself and supports itself. So you know, right wing media supporting right-wing politicians uh it's a kind of a it's a like it's a it's a, like a, an echo chamber is and, there money it's involved very, sorry, it's, to it's just, it, sorry is there money i mean was part of this the genesis of we'd of course at the same time we'd had uh, in inconvenient truth the al gore movie that was mm. around 2006 mm. um did was there a rise of sort of fossil fuel industry big money from from those companies tipping money in to start lobbying in a big way at that point to help fuel this? Was that part of the yeah. equation? Yeah, it, it definitely. Uh, and Michael Mann's uh, latest book, The New Climate Wars, you know, chronicles that 
in a very detailed way. Yes, there's the, the money and vested interest from the fossil fuel lobby is a big part of it, but it's it's not a, it, it's not it's part of the explanation. It's not the entirety of it. I mean, w what developed was uh, essentially the fascination of the right, the political right, instead of being focused on economics and arguing for smaller government, lower taxes, you know, more competition, that all that kind of stuff, uh, the, the political right became more focused on cultural issues and they weaponized, uh, for example, uh, gay marriage was, you know, was that was like a absolutely diabolical sort of kryptonite laden third rail in centre-right politics until we actually managed to legalise it. And then, of course, that subsided. And global warming or, and, you know, climate change and responses there too uh, have been the same, you know, whereas um, the, you know, the, the need for a rational response is self-evident. But it's not that, look, this denial of science is absolutely a thing. The problem we had with the NEG was... A, a, a minority, but a substantial minority, in the coalition party room who were prepared to cross the floor can, can and we, we might know, potentially bring down the, the control government room just stop there with uh, the neg? over the neg legislation. Yeah, thank you. Because I think we can go back and, and talk about the neg, which was um, the National Energy Guarantee, which I think was the closest we've come to actually managing to get um, over the line a, um, a piece of policy with the coalition government that might have um, begun to address our emissions um, in terms of energy use. Uh, and then, of course, the Prime Minister was one of the latest um, casualties uh, to have his leadership ended prematurely on the basis of, um, on the basis of a, rea a response to the climate change emergency. But he wasn't the, he wasn't the first. We saw two other leaders, um, you know, be rolled on the basis of their response to this issue, particularly, at least in my view. Um, and Jamila, I think you were on the forefront of that experience. Can you tell me what, can you, what, what are your memories? Can you summarise in, in dot point form how climate, um, the, clim the response to climate change had an impact in the Rudd office and then, and then in the Gillard offices, both in which you served? Mm. Um, so my a big issue, was, I know. <laughs> it sure is, and, I'm, and you're taking me back, I've got to say. Um, I remember the original Rudd ETS, and I remember the work that was being done, not just in the Prime Minister's office, but across uh, the board, certainly by Penny Wong at the time, um, and her advisors in doing the work to get that through the Senate. Um, and as I spoke before about how complex uh, that series of negotiations and that work is, um, it is not just a question of convincing people of the science or the model, particular model that's being adopted. It's more complex than that. And, of course, that was a very particular loss for the Labor government at the time because they were eventually defeated by the Greens in the Senate. Mm. So it wasn't about lack of action on climate change. It was about saying uh, the Greens at that time said, this does not go far enough. Uh, they wanted more from the legislation. And if I had to go back and pinpoint a moment, as you mentioned earlier, Christine, it would be then, because I think, to borrow a, a, an overused political phrase, but a good one, I think we let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Mm. Um, and what followed in the weeks after, which I think was just as impactful, was I remember that those uh, mining industry ads began being rolled out. And I remember watching one of those advertisements on my uh, ministerial office TV uh, for the first time and turning to the advisor who sat in the next room and just saying, oh, wow, we're in trouble. Yeah, uh, and I, I think... they were so good. It's worth pausing there and just to reminding everybody, of course, that was a period where the Rudd government had um, developed what was then called the CPRS, is that correct? The, the Carbon That's Pollution right. Reduction Scheme. And interestingly, um, I mean, Jam, you go to the impact of the Greens saying it hasn't gone far enough. And on the meantime, on the other side, you had Malcolm Turnbull um, trying to um, deal with his own sort of right-wing rump of, of that coalition, who didn't want anything to do with any, anything, who, in his book, 
claims that you know, the Rudd government or, or the Pri Prime Minister Rudd at the time didn't want to deal in the other side, the, the, the opposition, in any way. Didn't want to, you know, term, Prime Minister Turnbull, or former Prime Minister Turnbull, complains that as opposition leader, he wasn't given any input um, from the Rudd government, wasn't allowed into the conversation because they basically, you know, in his telling, wanted um, to maximise the pain for the opposition at the time. And as a result, uh, he wasn't able to bring his side on board or negotiate any of the amendments or say that we can support this because, um, you know, we've got these amendments um, in, involved. Is that his, just his version of history, Jamila? Do you remember that period? Was that a political game, I guess, from the Rudd government at the time to say, well, we're, we're going to maximise the pain for the opposition leader on this front? Well, I think it was a very different time and it's almost hard for us to imagine it right now. But at that point, it was politically popular to be doing something on climate change yes. and doing something big. You'd had John Howard come to the party very late uh, with support from a foreign emissions trading scheme that didn't go as far as what the um, then right opposition were um, uh, going to the election with, there was that stomping home of that election win. And you've got to remember the level of popularity the Rudd government had at that time. I, you know, there was a point around then or just before when Rudd's popularity and approval as PM was above 70%. Like, he was extraordinarily popular, which gave him, I think, the opportunity to push ahead with um, a scheme that would not only be effective in his view and that would get others on board and keep as many parties happy as possible while having positive action for the climate, but also he wanted the full credit. I think at a very political level, yeah, Labor wanted the credit. They they didn't want, they didn't think they needed necessarily strong support from the then opposition. But I think if we look at, we look back on it now, we can recognise that was a rare moment in time where you had the Greens, Labor and the Coalition all on the same page from a leadership perspective that they wanted this piece of policy to happen. And now what are we? We're in 2021, however many years later, and we're, no, we're certainly nowhere near as close as we were then. Yes, and of course, and then to sum up in quick succession, we have, you know, uh, Turnbull rolled in favour of, um, of Tony Abbott, who, of course, then decided that climate change was crap. Um, his words, not mine. We have um, Prime Minister you know, Gillard going to an election with you know, the mantra from the other side saying she's going to bring in a big climate, uh, sorry, a big carbon tax. Uh, and, and we know that from there, it only became more and more difficult. Um, Hugh, from a, from a scientific perspective, to go back to that perspective, can you tell me how do you and your colleagues feel when you say, is there a sense that the world's gone mad, that we've had 15 or so years of this now? to go back to that period, 2006 or so, 2006-07, where the science hasn't changed except to really say that, you know, things are actually getting worse. Yeah, we, well, scientists are often mad as well, I might say. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, I, I was at a meeting with Paul Gilding once, an environmental author from Tasmania, and, and I was expressing much of my frustration as a, you know, this was 15 years ago, and, and me being very naive, and still I am completely naive about politics, and he said, Hugh, governments aren't stupid, they're just slow. So that's it. I mean, they get there, uh, they wait generally for the democracy to be overwhelmingly in their favour. So we are, I, I did some uh, research before this, so I learnt the word technocracy, uh, and we're not that. We, we, the, the decisions are not made by scientists, economists and engineers. The decisions are made by the people of Australia. Um, and, uh, and then they go through the mechanisms of government and it seems to come out 5, 10, 15, 20 years later. So I actually have a good line on depressing almost all my environmental science students and PhD students saying, if you really want something to happen, build the evidence bring it to as many parties as possible, it will take you 10 to 20 years, I, I'm sorry. But do we have the luxury of that time now? Is you... oh, we don't have any luxury on that issue, we don't have luxury on biodiversity loss, we don't have uh, in, in that luxury on the way we treat Indigenous people. So th these are the embarrassing things. I've been 
to 60 countries and every Australian who goes overseas, you get hammered on these three issues. Biodiversity, the way we treat Indigenous Australians and climate change. And, and to me, that is telling. It's embarrassing and, and it's appalling. And, and it's something that I feel embarrassed to be an Australian because of. I think that sums it up. I just want to finish right there. Um, yeah, John, your, your memory from that time? Yeah, I just might add a, a slight um, refinement to Citizen Turnbull's account of the history. Um, <laughs> I thought... it, it's, it, it may well be true that had John Howard won the 2007 election, we'd have an ETS of some species, but the price of it would be we would also probably have a nuclear energy industry mm. because... He, he came back, he did, had his Damascene conversion on a trip to the United States where he was heavily lobbied by the nuclear power industry over there. And uh, he and his advisers came to the view that that was a very handy wedge uh, for the opposition, the Labor opposition, um, where there'd be people that would have um, very strong views in each direction and that it would be a very useful stick to go to an election with. Um, and he had to come up with uh, an alternative energy source to, to fossil fuels that was acceptable to his party room and to his party's traditional backers, the resource extraction industry being one of those, uh, and the di energy distribution industries, um, you know, changes if there was a new kind of power generation in the system. Uh, and, that, and nuclear energy afforded him that, um, that policy opportunity. Mm. So that, that bit of that story often gets left out. Mm, mm. And it's a really open question whether Australians would tolerate, if that were the deal, we'll have an ETS, but there's going to be a reactor in your electorate. Uh, Australians haven't really responded all that well to that proposition in the past, and I don't reckon they would today. Mm. Uh, and so it, it's easy to elide these things. And, and that was played for a very um, savvy political reason. It mm. wasn't a, a matter of policy purity at all. <laughs> policy purity. Yeah. When was the yeah. last time we saw that? Um, I think we may have another Twitter question. I'm just going to check. Twitter questions. No, I'm getting the Twitter... Okay, give me a, a Twitter question on that, um, on that issue. And then we may go back to um, Malcolm Turnbull and hear what he had to say about the latest iteration. But firstly, what would be your actions to enable an Australian with, uh, Australia with politics that are in, informed by scientific evidence? Oh, okay, so what, what can we do to make sure that we do have politics or perhaps policy it's informed by, better informed by scientific evidence. Any quick and easy answers to that question? I was wondering, actually, and, and, so, and Hugh, maybe you're the person to speak about this as chief scientist for a government. Um, would it help to have some um, expectation or obligation that when you bring a policy proposal into the Cabinet room, regardless of the policy, mm. you have to address what the science says about said policy? The science, the social science, the economics should yes. all be on the table. And, and I think it's really in that word ask, as I said before, yes. I think we need to empower our politicians to ask those questions, form more committees. Uh, in the United Kingdom, they don't only have a chief scientist, they have a chief scientist for every single minister. Mm. And so they're providing evidence on a continuous basis and they assemble that. And, and we, we, this forums sounding a bit like, let's beat up politicians, let me beat up scientists uh, for a small while, because I'm a masochist, um, we often uh, are to, to blame. So I had a very good relationship with Senator Robert Hill, and he said to me once, Hugh, every time I ask for a scientist for evidence on a particular conservation or environmental issue, they ask me for $10 million in five years. <laughs> that is not the answer. And so scientists have been their own worst enemy. And he said, you're the only one who actually says, actually, Robert, I'm not the expert on that. You could go and talk to Mary. Uh, she is the expert. But in the meantime, I'll give you my best opinion. I'm never going to ask you for money. And so scientists see politicians as pinata things, and they beat them until money comes out of them. And, and this is a disaster. So we are our worst advocates. And then Robert said to me once, well, how come so many environmental scientists say they don't know? What have they been doing for the last 30 years if they know nothing? <laughs> And so it's a cultural problem. I mean, really, mm. I don't want to beat up on scientists too much either, but you should give the answers you have. If you don't uh, have enough money, enough funding going into um, mm. a sector, though, mm. do you encourage that? that you can still give an get... answer. 
Yeah, you can true. give it an answer with some level of probability and uncertainty and say, but if you want better information, then we will need those resources. And mm -hmm. this is a value of information. How much more time do we need to spend resolving uncertainty to mm -hmm. make a decision? And I would say often we don't have a lot of time. And this is an issue. These three issues I raised are areas where I think it's indisputable. The worst thing that can happen, in fact, is scientists are bought off and they said, well, uh, let's just stop this until we find out the truth and 10 years mm -hmm. pass. John, as somebody who's, I mean, you've worked in, in, in politics and, and giving advice, and now you're working with a, a university. Um, do you pick up a, con do you have concerns about this shift in public, um, the way the public uh, uh, engages with science and scientific opinion? I don't know if you see it, maybe your student body is obviously, may not be the representative of Australians generally, but I am often shocked that there is an openness to it, to this idea that the science is just crap. Where's that coming from and how do we change it? I, I think there is um, a tweak that's required in the public discourse. It's not much of a tweak, but it's an important one, and it's around the question of doubt. Um, people say to me, there was a session on here last night, um, I gather, about um, do, you know, how do you trust a scientist or how do you trust science? Um, I, and, and most people, I think, who work in research domains or whatever field, I wouldn't trust anybody who's dead certain of anything um, inside science. Um, that, that person is probably trying to sell you something, um, and it's probably the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, <laughs> but in the public discourse, doubt is, um, is being fashioned in such a way as to undermine confidence in expert advice, mm. uh, instead of bolster that your expert knows the limits of their knowledge which should be inspiring confidence. And so I think we've all got a job to do. I think that's, that's a journalism job. I think it's a, a public sector job, the politicians and the bureaucrats. I think the universities have to get better at explaining that us not saying we're certain of something isn't uh, a reason for you to run off and say, oh, well, there's no point taking it on board mm. at all. Mm. Um, on the contrary, uh, that actually should inspire confidence that these people are presenting their expertise in a responsible way. Okay, now I know we don't have much time and we do have a, a bit more from Malcolm Turnbull just to set the scene. I asked him about, you know, he, he and I believe it was Josh Frydenberg particularly uh, and, and Scott Morrison to a degree, then you know, developed the NEG, the National Energy Guarantee, which should have moved us forward again. And then instead he was, he was rolled uh, um, by, it turns out, Scott Morrison. I asked him what he thought, where we could go from there. Um, and we'll just go back to that interview. A, a minority, but a substantial minority, in the coalition party room who were prepared to cross the floor and, you know, potentially bring down the government uh, over the NEG legislation. And, the, and there was a, a view held by many of them, particularly Abbott, particularly Murdoch, that... It was better to have a shortened Labor government if that was the price of getting rid of me. I mean, this is what Rupert Murdoch said to Kerry Stokes. Mm. I mean, if you read my book, mm. uh, Murdoch acknowledged it as much in his con direct conversation with me, and this was certainly their agenda. So you're dealing with very... It's, it's r really weird stuff, right? So, uh, But they, uh, th there is a view, a channel of thought... On the right, uh, you know, the populist right, I guess you could call it, that believes that, you know, in Tony Abbott's immortal words, that climate change is crap. And the, and you know, that is, that's, <laughs> that's what you grapple with. And the problem that the coalition has is that there is, that group operate like terrorists. Now, I hasten to add they're not using bombs and knives and so forth. But their technique is the technique of the terrorist in the sense that they say, unless you give me what we want, we will blow the joint up. And you see this bullying all the time. I mean, you know, it is, it, there's a sort of right at the heart of the coalition is this thuggery. And it is enabled, enlivened, amplified by uh, their friends in the media. So um, ultimately that you know, managing that, navigating that was enormously difficult. And, um, you know, the, the I mean, I, I to be honest with you, and this shows you know, I was clearly mistaken, I thought their motives in August of 2018 were largely to get rid of me. 
to be honest. Mm. And I thought that after Morrison had been re-elected, I thought the Meg would reappear. Really? Oh. Yeah, I did, because he supported it, Josh yes. Frydenberg supported it, and I thought, well, you know, the industry wants it. Like, it, it was clearly the right thing to do. And, you know, I never abandoned it. I mean, the only thing, the only decision the Cabinet made in that beginning of that crazy week in August was uh, to not put the bill into the House that week because we was, it was obvious there was a huge collision building up, so it was a, it was a timing issue. Uh, we never abandoned it as policy, but Morrison did abandon it. Mm. And so as a result, we do not have any federal policy that integrates climate and energy. And so inevitably, leadership on climate and energy policy is being taken up by the states. You know, so the vacuum, the Commonwealth is just is barely a player. I mean, the only only sort of uh, really significant thing the Commonwealth has got going on the climate, on the energy front, is uh, Snowy Hydro 2.0, which of course was a project I'm I going started. to interrupt. Uh, would you say that? So at least they haven't abandoned. I'm going to interrupt Malcolm Turnbull there. As you can see, it's always very hard to get a word in edgewise with Malcolm when he's, <laughs> when he's on a roll about his book, um, but he was very generous with his time. I think we don't have long to go, but I would ask, I think I'm going to ask each of you, because hearing that can be incredibly depressing. We're up against mm. a very strange time in politics. We're up in a, at a time when our media can be, is, is dominated by some, you know, they'll, they'll deny it, but some climate denialists. Um, I'm going to ask each of you, what would you, what's your advice to people, you know, our citizenry, if they want to see change? What's the best way? Should they be getting involved with a political party? Should they be out on the streets protesting? What's the one thing we can do when we think that's not good enough, we want to, we want to change things? Um, and I'm going to start with you, Hugh. Um, yes and yes. Um, and I think um, uh, Australian politicians, we can complain about them as much as we like, but they are quite accessible. You can still write to them, meet to them. They'll answer your letters. Your local MP, federal and state will take a meeting from everybody in this room and put your view, because that is worth a 1,000 votes. You can do that, and you don't have to uh, vote again for the next 20 lifetimes. John, what about you? Uh, I'm a member of the Carlton Football Club, so I can tell you it's very oh, difficult to win a game from the grandstand. <laughs> you've got to... Hugh's right, you've got to run on the field. Uh, join a party. I don't even care which one. Um, yep. and, and get involved. Um, the other thing is be prepared to vote on this issue. Because one of the reasons they can steer you down is they think, yeah, I know they care and they're out on the street and it's terrific, but when the chips are down, they're going to look after their... You know, hip pocket. It's a butter yeah. emails kind of thing. It's a but the franking credits, you know, that kind of stuff. It's like, be prepared to do that and write to your MP and tell them. Look them in the eye and say, you're going to lose my vote if we don't do something about climate. Because all the other stuff pales into its significance if we don't have a future. Jamila, I know you have a lovely little boy at home who's not very well this morning. Um, when he says, Mum, what are you doing about this? And also, what can I do about it? What do you tell him? Well, he was uh, there with me at those climate protests at the end of 2019, even though at the time he wasn't old enough for school. Um, and I think we've been having those conversations in the home for a very long time. Um, and we'll continue to. And one of the things that I know about this next generation coming through, not just my five-year-old now, but kids who are older, is that they are adamant and that they are angry and that they are immovable. And I think the largest of their frustrations is they should not have to be doing this work. Um, one of the things that continually annoys me is the number of all of us adults who stand back and go, wow, look at those kids. Aren't they phenomenal? This should not be their job. This is not their fight. If they're having to have this fight, then we failed. So I think we need to be the ones who are getting angry as adults. We need to be the ones who are protesting, rallying, joining political parties, writing to politicians and saying, yes, this will change my vote. Because I think sitting back and looking at the kids and going, oh, they've got it sorted, is actually doing them a huge disservice. Mm -hmm. All right. You've got your marching orders. We could have talked about this for another whole hour. In fact, Malcolm did with me on Friday. <laughs> but I want to thank you all today for your engagement. It gives us great hope that there are people who care about this. Thank you, Hugh, John, and, of course, Jamila at home. Thank you very much. Thank you.